For as long as we've had them, ideas have saved lives and ideas have killed people. Ideas have caused revolutions and ideas maintain the status quo. Ideas, one could say, are the root of all action and inaction. This is a question useful to do both of It's when ideas are put to the field that we can finally find what sticks to the wall and assured of the validity they spread. Today, as always, ideas drive us towards new horizons, towards unseen destinations and uncharted waters. Each time we talk about them, these ideas are tested in the battlegrounds of the mind and some, more resilient than others, put into practice by unique individuals. We are here today to provide a platform to these ideas that are worth sharing. Greetings and Greetings. namaste. This is Rasik Chand, one of the organizers of TEDx Maitigar and your host for today. It is with great pleasure that I would like to welcome you all for tuning in for the first ever iteration of TEDcast, organized by TEDx Maitigar. TEDx Maitigar is an officially licensed TED event, which aims to bring the spirit of TED's mission of ideas worth spreading to local communities around the globe. Having already organized a TEDx event and several TED circles, we bring to you today TEDcast. TEDcast is an interactive live idea sharing session initiated by TEDx Maitigar with the aim of connecting minds. In this series, we plan to invite personalities from different fields to impart ideas on their respective expertise. The series aims to bridge the idea gap and provide a live virtual platform to interact directly with the invited speakers and audience. With a live broadcast in place, TEDcast aims to promote discussions related to the ideas that guest speakers will impart. We'd also like to thank StreamYards for supporting us by providing their premium services free of charge. Today we have with us Mr. Sajit Chandra Sakya as the inaugural speaker of TEDcast organized by TEDx Maitigar. A reputed physics lecturer at various institutions of Kathmandu, Mr. Sakya tirelessly works every day, driving above the equation of physics to integrate subtle values with academics. A charismatic human who, for his students, is an epitome of a keen learner who loves to evolve and has mastered his art, teaching with sheer amount of values and discipline. For a commoner, he is someone who has managed to take a special spot, balancing everything that comes to him in life. For everyone that has had the pleasure of getting to know him, he has been an inspiration. It is that discipline engraved in the culture that makes Sajit Chandra Sakya a teacher who is more than just lectures and notes. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to welcome Mr. Sajit Chandra Sakya back to TEDx Maitigar. Thank you, Sajid, sir, for tuning in with us today. Thanks, Rasik, and uh, thanks, Adilix Maitigar, once again. So my good morning to all. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. And my Namaskar, Namaste to all of you. So, sir, before moving on to the questions, I'm sure our viewers would like to know more about you and your teaching journey. So if you could please tell us a bit about the journey and the motivating factor for you to start teaching. Are there any particular incidents that drove you to start teaching? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I started a teaching career because of incidents, incident actually. Uh, there is no motivation for that. Uh, it's because uh, uh, my family has been traditionally teachers. Uh, it is called as Gurzu in, in the local language, Gurzu. So, but about uh, three or four generations back, uh, that uh, took a break since my one of the great great grandfathers decided to go to business. So he took a break and uh, my grandfather, uh, he wanted that uh, I become a teacher. So I was his uh, uh, eldest grandson, grandson, and uh, he passed away very early. But uh, before he passed away, uh, he told my parents that uh, make him a teacher. And uh, uh, they had established a school in our locality about 100 meters away from our, our traditional house in Bhaktapur. And he said that uh, uh, let him be teacher and let him handle the school. So uh, nowadays, uh, the school is not there. 
and grandfather is also not there, but the, the teaching is there. So that is that is the, the career choice that is shaped by a dream of my grandfather. And my parents also, uh, they always wanted that I fulfill his wishes. So that's why I'm into teaching field. So no motivation was required for that. It was just uh, uh -huh. uh, the of my grandfather that took its shape in Yes, sir. Of course, teaching is such a noble profession, which carries with it such great responsibilities towards the students, towards the society as a whole. And as you said, you come from a generation of teachers. So is there a particular philosophy that you have towards teaching or a piece of advice, a guiding principle that someone gave to you about teaching that has helped shape how you teach? Okay, in this regard, uh, what happened was uh, when I studied education in my master's, uh, MPhil in education, I studied at KU, and uh, there I studied uh, various philosophies of teaching, uh, various branches of teaching, various ways of teaching, various theories of teaching. But uh, what I felt was uh, all of them were just stereotypes. Uh, they were actually, uh, uh, there was initially some theories and all other theories were derived from those theories. But in practical, uh, when I entered teaching field, none of those philosophies matched. None of those philosophies matched uh, what I felt. So my philosophy of teaching is uh, uh, actually we, uh, everybody wants to rise. Everybody wants to uh, say complex things. Everybody wants to make things complex. But my philosophy of teaching has been uh, come down, come down or calm down, I would say. I would say be the very simplest. My philosophy has been very, very simple. So if you want to understand uh, some complex things, you have to go to the very depth. You have to be the very simple and you have to be a commoner if you want to become great, if you want to learn right. something. So that has been my uh, teaching philosophy throughout these years. And I leave, I leave no stone unturned to make things simple. To come to, even if I teach at A level or plus two, I'll be telling them things when, what they study in class four or five. And uh, mm -hmm. what I felt was, students really feel happy um, for being taken into their childhoods, though they're at yeah. their teenage. So they feel that, oh, I studied this in class four and so he's saying like that. But I feel a sense of happiness in them. So my philosophy has been to go to the simplest, go to the very basic or the very base. So if the base is strong, everything becomes stronger, everything becomes brighter and better. Exactly, sir. Thank you for sharing that. And I'd also like to add the if the viewers tuning in with us from Facebook. If you have any questions, then please do leave it in the comment sections. After we are done with the one-on-one -on -one sessions, we'll be more than happy to entertain the questions if there are any. So there is a saying that life as a teacher begins the day you realize you're always a learner. So what according to you is the definition of a lifelong learner? And how can you, or more specifically, how do you promote lifelong learning in the classroom as well? Actually, the uh, phrase itself has got its meaning. It has got life, it has got long, it has got learner. So it means that uh, we learn from whatever we can. We learn from whatever we can, whenever we can. Uh, and uh, I often say to students, even if you decide that uh, you will not learn anything, you will learn that not learning anything is very difficult. Because even if you do not do anything, if you do not, uh, if you do not think anything, you will feel that not thinking itself is very difficult. So that's a part of learning. So that's why we cannot, we cannot not learn anything throughout our, throughout our life. So that's why we learn everything we learn. Uh, if every experience is learning, uh, I saw one uh, one person who just retired from the government office, and he was learning that. After he stopped going to his office, he was learning that uh, sitting idly is so difficult. He used to be so active in his office, but now he has to stay at home. He goes to some uh, tea, tea, uh, tea shops, he consumes tea, he writes some scripts, he's, he writes. But uh, he missed that part of working. So he must be learning that not working is very difficult. Previously, he used to say that, oh, I'm tired because of this work. I would rest like that. But uh, what I felt was when I see him in the tea shops, and I, I, I feel that he learned that, oh, this is the very difficult phase of my life. He could have learned. And the same thing happened uh, during this pandemic also. Uh, many people said that, uh, I want holiday, I want holiday, I want holiday. And somebody was saying that, 
uh, I need a six month holiday twice a day. And yes, this uh, COVID-19 gave them holidays. And then that started their difficulties because they felt that having holiday is not a luxury. Actually, it is some sort of trouble. So that's uh, we we suffered a lot because of those holidays. So it uh, uh, deteriorated our mental condition, it did our physical conditions, it deteriorated our economy and so on. So now I think uh, after this thing is over, people will never uh, aim for long holidays. Definitely not. That's why yeah. they're not a lot. Even doing nothing, they're not a lot. So that's why lifelong learning means, uh, in, my, in my opinion, it is learning from every second, every experience, every people, not only people, every animal, every every insect, or like that. Even if you watch a movie, you can learn things. If you, even if you watch some some cereals, you, know, you can learn things. If you, even if you go to your, your your garden and plant trees or water trees, you are learning something. So until your sense organs are active, you are learning. Even if some of the sense organs are not active, even you learn. For example, if a man loses his vision, if a person loses his vision, then he's learning new things. And uh, and uh, believe me, uh, the the pace of his learning will be very fast. Even after that, even if the eye doesn't work, other organs become active. So he'll be learning more and more, or learning faster and faster by using other organs. So that's what life learning is. So every second we learn. Indeed, that's sir. Very well said. Uh, truly, every experience contributes in some way or other to our learning journey. And in the end, it's the perspective that matters. Yeah, yeah. So you've been teaching for a long time now and definitely have amassed a lot of experiences. So in the present context uh, regarding the education system in Nepal, in your view, what are the things that stand out like the best or worst thing about the education system at present? Uh, the best thing uh, in a Nepalese education system is, so there are people who find that uh, there are not even good things, but I'm a very optimistic person in that regard. So the best thing in our education is in Nepal, we learn by heart. We learn or teach by heart. So that, that is the basic thing. Yeah? Uh, we are not uh, missionary people. Uh, we are not technical people. For example, if I uh, tell students to do uh, the homeworks tomorrow, uh, I will be accepting the homework day after tomorrow as well. Because uh, that, that's me. Because that's uh, me and my friends. We work by heart. Uh, but in foreign countries, uh, they would say, uh, submit your homework by this day, this day, this time. So even if a person is uh, one second or two seconds late, that will not be accepted. So they work, uh, they work like machines, but we work by heart. So when we work by heart, uh, we can touch other people's brains and heart as well by our education system. So that is a good thing about us. That is uh, at policy level. But uh, if I go for poor things uh, uh, or worse things, uh, I would say there is no thing. Uh, so there are many, many worse things. For example, uh, during this pandemic also, we were talking of uh, social distance, social distance, but uh, students came to protest against uh, several things, but and they were not maintaining social distance. So they were trying to trying to get smarter than the government, but they are not even following the simple philosophy of social distancing. So what is the use of the system? They are blaming the system, but actually as individuals, they have failed. So when individuals fail, the system is bound to fail. And the other, uh, other things that uh, are poor in our uh, system is uh, a person becomes a principal in government schools, let us say, becomes a principal and uh, suddenly his uh, skin starts to get bright. He becomes cheerful and uh, uh, he will change his motorbike in villages. He'll change his motorbike. The motorbike becomes new from old and uh, his uh, furniture is changed. They become new from old. So that is a very bad part of education because a principal, when he becomes a principal, he are getting benefits from something else, somebody else. So actually what should have been done was he should not be seeking benefits. As a principal, he should not be getting benefits, but he gets. It. So that's a very poor part of a system in our country. What happens in other fields have also crept into the field of education. So when, he beca when somebody becomes a department head, he starts to change. When somebody becomes principal, he starts to change. When somebody becomes a uh, uh, district education officer, DO, we say, he starts to change. His, his preferences start to change. So that's a very bad part of education. As a whole, bad part of the whole system. But in terms of education, it is even, it is even worse part. 
So uh, education, which is supposed to be a noble profession, uh, we suppose that, but uh, people who are involved in education, uh, they suddenly seem to change. So when there is change, that means something is fishy there. So that is a very yeah. bad part of education, I suppose, in our country. So, yeah. So, so, so I really... More, but yeah. still... Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, sir. So speaking about the present context, so we came across this fact, which was from the New York Academy of Science, that 70% of American faculty have not taught an online course before the COVID-19 pandemic. So now in the present context of Nepal, that percentage might even be higher. And given these circumstances, there's not a lot of options, alternatives to remote learning. So you might also be teaching online courses now. So how do you think uh, teaching has become different with the arrival of online learning during this pandemic? And if you have any experiences also, we'd love to hear those. Yeah, definitely it has become different. So. Uh... Let me quote one incident from my own life also. Uh, I started teaching about 20 years back. Uh, I first started with school. Uh, I, I taught in a certain school, a certain school in class nine and 10, nine and 10. So uh, as I started earning, the first thing I bought from my earning was a computer, a desktop computer. And why did I buy it? I bought it because I could make notes, not those handwritten notes, I could make printed notes. And I plan that I'll buy, I'll buy printer, I'll print them, I'll distribute them, and so on. And everybody uh, just uh, joked at me because you are buying computer out of your uh, earning from teaching. Buy a bike, they said. No, no, no. Uh, bike is not of my interest right now. So my interest is a computer, definitely. There's so much more things to learn. And I feel that uh, uh, computers can be a very good to, good to the field of education, I said. And I bought computer, I uh, connected to the net also. In those days, uh, internet was very expensive. Uh, the maximum I paid was uh, rupees six per minute. Rupees six per minute. Yeah? I can remember that data very uh, clearly from Worldlink. Rupees six per minute. So with rupees six per minute, uh, I had to wait for around five minutes to download a picture from CNN. CNN. So that was the time. And uh, there I saw a website called uh, website by a German professor. Walter Fent. And uh, when I went to that website, uh, I was just amazed. They were so technically forward. Even nowadays also, that website is operating. So I felt that we are very, very backward in that sense, in terms of education. So that's why I used my desktop computer almost fully to education. Sometimes I did watch movies, but uh, most of the, my uh, desktop space is still filled with notes, with uh, materials, with uh, books, with uh, uh, with uh, copies, scans of copies of students, of uh, other teachers and so on. So that's why uh, in that sense, uh, I was very ahead of time. Then came uh, several other gadgets and uh, I saw uh, about uh, 15 years back, I saw over overhead projector in one of the uh, institutions that I work in. So as I soon uh, I saw that, I, I, I decided I'll use it. So I uh, asked the college authorities and I taught a topic, uh, alternating current AC, what we call as. So I taught AC fully on the projector and uh, the and the uh, ceo of the college he came with a camera so let me let me let me take a photo we'll use that in a browser so that happened about 15 years back and even in uh, 2003 about uh, 17 years back uh, when i defended my mphil thesis in ku ku i bought a laser pointer i happened to buy i, I saw it on the road with uh, with some uh, some seller there and when i used it the teachers were so happy professor was even i'll use it they would say Yes. So that's why uh, in Nepal, uh, in everywhere in the world, there have been some uh, technically savvy people and technically uh, backward people. So in USA also, that happened. So 70% of the professors did not use any online uh, education system. And in Nepal also, it's the same. But uh, uh, I have been very forward in that. I did uh, use that system. I used that system. And uh, definitely, I feel that uh, students have uh, benefited uh, very much. But now with uh, pandemics like uh, COVID, Online education is the only savior, only savior. We don't have options. So that's why definitely people have thought it difficult. Yeah, it's difficult. It's true. But uh, learning uh, learning how to deliver online education is not that difficult. Because once we start uh, uh, the, the, to feel the necessity, definitely that thing is never difficult. For example, uh, a child, 
a child uh, of nowadays uh, need not be taught how to use the mobile. Need not be taught. The, he or she just copies and he can do that. So if you have uh, such a childlike uh, uh, enthusiasm with us, definitely this uh, learning these things is not difficult. And uh, we can see many, many resources, uh, resources in the internet. And teachers are using every resources at their home to set up, to set up their uh, household classroom, let us say online classroom. So we don't need expensive gadgets. The gadgets that we have been using for Facebook chatting or video calls are enough for on online uh, education. So that is just uh, allocation of resources or just uh, redirection of resources, which will help in that. So that's why even if uh, people are not that much uh, uh, familiar with online uh, uh, education system, definitely uh, switching is not that much difficult. And, and uh, we have every reason to be hopeful, hopeful that uh, definitely we can deliver a better education with online education, almost at par with our face-to-face -face education. And that's happening, that we are seeing that in the results of the students. And uh, we are seeing the, uh, about the uh, attendance of the students. And in uh, some of the colleges where students did not uh, enjoy staying in class, definitely they enjoy staying in online classroom. They, 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 they find it uh, happy. They, they feel happy when they interact with teachers. And uh, uh, when they are, they are being educated at their home, I think uh, uh, students have uh, liked it very much because they don't have to, the, they ha they don't have to take the uh, trouble of going to college or get contaminated. They can stay home and still the teachers are doing very hard work for them. So they're happy about that. So that's a very positive sign about online education. People might say difficult, but the satisfaction that we obtain from online education is very great. Yeah. So that's why yeah. it is easier for me to switch. And it would have been easier for my colleagues as well. Initially, it was difficult, one or two weeks. But now mm -hmm. everybody are now habituated. And we don't complain much now. They used to complain, yes. but now they are not complaining. Yeah, that's really reassuring to hear. And the least we can do is stay hopeful. So yes. continuing with the same theme. So do you think the current infrastructure of technology is like sustainable in the long run? So even after like the curve is flattened and social distancing illusion, will e-learning and interactive learning be an integral part of the classroom? Yes, of course, of course. Because uh, what I am myself uh, uh, thinking that I have told some of my colleagues also, I think our institutions will make at least some part of our course online. What I'm saying is, what, what I, I, I told my, my colleagues that, uh, whether it will be true or not, uh, what I told them was they will think the, 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 the higher authorities will definitely think that some part of the course, maybe of physics or maybe of chemistry should be taught online. They might take that. And that is very good for us because that will help us learn new, new and better things. And definitely there will be more and more platforms of online learning. Till now we had Zoom only. Zoom was just a conferencing site. Meeting, people used to conduct meetings. And that has been used to conduct the classes. And because of Zoom, uh, because of the popularity of Zoom, if you can go to the data of Zoom, uh, I heard somewhere, I read somewhere that before lockdown, they had only about 10 million customers. But after lockdown, about two months uh, uh, of lockdown, they had uh, only 200 million. And now it's only four months. So their customer base has in, would have increased even more than that. So yeah. uh, going through the popularity of Zoom, even Microsoft has got its own software. Google has got its own software. Fiber is, uh, has a, uh, improved its conferencing and so on. Uh, and, and everybody is doing that. So that means the base of on, the base and the span of online education system is uh, increasing. And so that's why even me, uh, who did not take online seriously, it was just a, a pastime for me. It was just a something, something different. But now I'm, a, I'm trying uh, other alternatives other than Zoom. So I would be searching. There are even other softwares which are new which are maybe which are very costly also, so not popular. But definitely what I feel is online system will be a very, very integral part of our life. And there will, yes, be, there will be lots of online degrees, maybe online degrees and those and they will be they will stand out as equal as offline degrees. Definitely, yes. And that is my yes, belief so, system. So do you feel that in some regards that COVID-19 has accelerated this process? Uh, which was inevit inevitable, like of we are course, shifting. Of course. Yeah. of course, yes. Because uh, had it not been COVID-19, the process would have been very slow, very slow. 
because we had the choice of face to face uh, education system but of course yes the, this uh, uh, because of this virus online education has been the only choice yeah is not among uh, many choices but now it is the only choice so definitely it is bound to increase as i said about the data of zoom actually so uh, now zoom is every other company companies have their their uh, their their uh, profits profits decreased but the zoom's profit has uh, zoomed zoom's profit zoomed <laughs> So yeah. Google might be getting less profit from other fields, but their profit from Google Meet will be will be very high. Same with Microsoft. So that's why they took a quantum leap from uh, from their attention to other softwares to their attention to these online education systems. So many more companies would come. For example, the Adobe company would also come with uh, some sort of those things. So till now, Google, Microsoft are there. So Adobe could come, and others also uh, companies of several other businesses. Amazon will also come with something something else. So definitely that is bound to increase and there's and uh, in future we'll have many many choices among them so it will not be as difficult as, as now so nowadays what we say if zoom crashes we say we, we think that we are doomed but but later what we can have if not zoom let us go to this if not this let us go to this and so on yeah so definitely it has accelerated and it is very good for we people and very of good course. for people it's very good for education as a whole indeed so Let's stay hopeful and let's hope that even more good things come out of this. Of course, so, we have to be hopeful. Yes, sir. So moving on to the next question. So according to the world's largest teacher burnout survey, which had almost 15,000 teachers participate in, 32% of teachers said that they felt happy and not stressed in their working lives and have a healthy balance. But the greater percentage, 68% of teachers feel stressed at work. And now with the lockdown and e-learning, the balance is more disrupted in some regards. So has this been an issue for you? And how do you maintain that work-life balance and keep yourself motivated? Uh, as I previously said, uh, motivation is not an issue here. Uh, when we say motivation, motivation is like bathing. Bathing. So uh, when you bath, uh, we remain fresh for a few hours, and then again uh, the body starts to sing, stink. So motivation is also like that. You, uh, you listen to a motivating uh, seminar, you get motivated for a few hours, and later again the curve flattens. So it's not about motivation actually. It's about necessity. We don't uh, need to get motivated to breathe. Right. There's no requirement of motivation. We breathe. We, it's our natural process. We don't uh, need motivation to go to toilet. It's, it's our necessity to have food. It's our necessity. So here also, uh, um, what, what I like, like to say is, uh, when we were having face-to-face -face classes, most of uh, my time was spent on traveling. Traveling from one institution to another institution, traveling till institution in traffic jams and so on. So uh, to get over the traffic jam, I also rode uh, bicycles, or let's say mountain bikes, let's say. It helped ease the traffic very much, but the pollution factor was there. Now, what happened was that traveling time has been saved. The traveling time has been saved. So that's why uh, I can devote more of my energy to my own personal benefit or, 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 or that education as a whole. In addition, uh, previously, what used to have uh, was we used, we used to have uh, continuous classes, two classes continuous or three classes continuous. And now what we have is we have breaks. We, have, we can afford breaks because uh, our traveling time has been saved. So that's why let's take it positive, I would say. Let's take it positive way. And we, we can have uh, uh, lunch at home. We can have uh, teas and snacks at home. We don't have to go to the canteens and uh, stand in queues like that. So people might uh, feel that uh, they are locked at home, but uh, we have to go to the positive side also. And we are at home. We are attending to our household works also. We are with our children. We are with our family. And still we are doing equal duty as well. All because... We have saved time. And uh, previously, what used to happen was uh, when people uh, finish their official duty and they come back home, uh, they never come back in a straight line. What I often give example is when they go to workplace, they go in straight line. And when they come back, they just uh, drift and drift and drift and they come back home. So that time has been saved. And, uh, and uh, the, the environment now is, uh, now is definitely not conducive for drifting also. And that's why uh, even if we go out to 
for some some minor task also we come back home easily so that's why teaching from home has been uh, not that much stressful as a stress in the media and these media people are very sensitive in that even if they find a stress in one person they would say they found stress in 1000 person so when mm -hmm. i i ask my friends my colleagues and uh, uh, when i ask about this this stress level or emotional level they feel that uh, life has been easier initially few weeks there was difficulty in learning but after once they that thing uh, was set into uh, set into a proper track uh, things have been less stressful they say so this stress factor i think it's mentioned that was uh, uh, done in the initial days but uh, nowadays that has also to decrease we have been habituated and we have started to believe it's a part of life and we can't come with part of life. yes sir. so definitely we cannot generalize things and it's the perspective that matters and uh, 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 let me let me add one thing and uh, when we listen to media we are actually listening to the idea of the media people and we are not listening to the idea of general people so whenever media says something the first thing that come into my mind is it should be untrue i'm like that sort of person. i don't know why because of so much of media bashing i would say it should be untrue so when i first heard uh, about this covid 19 in from wuhan china i said eh, they are making uh, making whole issue out of uh, small things and they, what i felt was uh, whatever happens in China, the Western world and the Indian media think that it's bad. Even if China would make a make a robot that may help in all our household works, it will say that is bad. So that is China bashing, I would say. So because of that, I felt that it should be untrue. But later on, it came yeah. true. So that's why. Uh, that's why. Uh, so this uh, this whole feeling, this old saying should sayings have been fueled by media. And when media fuels, people are bound to believe. There is yes. very little way we can escape from the bashing of the media. And it is yeah. our duty to sort which is which one is better, which one might be true, which one might not be true, and so on. So we have to very treat very carefully in that sense. Exactly, sir. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And again, I'd like to ask our viewers, if you have any questions, then do drop those in the comment sections. We'll be getting to those questions as well. And now moving on. So being a physics lecturer, so what according to you is the hardest part of being teaching physics? Uh, I think I have got over that part, actually. Uh, the hardest part was when I... Uh, when I was in college, and when my teachers were struggling to struggling to explain our concept, so I felt that uh, this concept thing is definitely difficult. When I was in class uh, eight, class eight, uh, there was a ma'am who was teaching us chemistry. Actually, she was a graduate of biology, zoology. Actually, later on I came to know. But in school, uh, they have to teach every subject. So in biology, she was very comfortable. In physics, less comfortable. In chemistry, she, she was very, very less comfortable. Now, she had to uh, teach a topic called a spectrograph. And that was a really difficult job for her. So what we did was we in the first bench, we were in the first bench, and we used to talk very freely with ma'am. We said uh, we said to ma'am, ma'am, was it difficult for you? She said, yes. Actually, I'm a biology graduate, and I am uh, having to teach this thing. Very difficult for me. And I told to ma'am that, ma'am, skip it. Give it, give uh, our friends as homework. Give it as a homework, and you skip it, and be very strict. I said, we said actually, we from the few first bench, and ma'am did the thing. So ma'am was saved from the embarrassment there, and we said to our friends, ah, it, it is easy, it's very easy, and uh, that's why ma'am told you to do that yourself. So we 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 made things comfortable for ma'am. So that's why uh, explaining concept uh, was the hardest part, I suppose. But uh, as I entered into teaching field, the first year it was hard, definitely, because I did not know exactly how to do that. But from the second year, the whole first year was uh, like a second school for me. I learned a lot of things. I interacted with uh, lots of students. And I also talked with uh, lots of my senior colleagues. How do they put the, those theories? So in those days, I was uh, much like a student teacher rather than a teacher. The college was paying me to learn, actually. The college was paying me, but I was learning things. So I often, uh, I often laughed at myself also, at the college also. They appointed me to teach, but I was there learning things. 
I was learning from the lab boy. I was learning from uh, from very intelligent students. I was learning from senior teachers. I was learning from those teachers who came to uh, that college to uh, pay a visit during some seminars or like that. And that gave me lots of experiences. So the hardest part was the concept part. And uh, uh, one of the senior colleagues told me that uh, when you teach concepts, be the go to the very basic, he said. And that is the philosophy I have been following. So I have already got over that hardest part. And nowadays, the hard part is... Uh, and the hard part now, nowadays is uh, keeping students awake in classroom. Keeping students awake in classroom. So about 15, 20 years back, uh, when a student yawned in classroom, it was a surprise. It used to be a surprise. And if somebody mm -hmm. yawns and his friends or her friends will look at her or him, you're yawning in classroom. What's that? But nowadays, yawning is a freaking problem. Why? Because uh, they are busy in their social media late night. Maybe they are busy playing PUBG also. Maybe they are busy playing something. Anyway, they are doing activities that deprive them of sleep. And yeah. in classroom, uh, what happens is definitely that will, uh, when you, whenever you sit idle, your that uh, sleep part, that uh, sleep demon will take you over. And uh, making them awake in classroom is very difficult. And I have to try several techniques, several techniques and uh, several uh, sometimes threatening also, sometimes uh, pleasantly also I have to tell them. And uh, in these these uh, five or six years, I have had to devise lots of techniques to keep them awake in classroom. So I think that is the hardest part right now. Understanding is not a part. I think I can make them do that. Concept is also not a not a, that a hard part, but making them awake has been hard part. And it, and when I talk to uh, my colleagues, they also find the same. And uh, and uh, some some uh, and some students said that in one of the colleges I. I thought, uh, I felt that among 40 students, there are 40 students in the classroom, about six or seven were almost sleeping. And I, yeah. I pointed to him, I, I, I uh, told his friend to just uh, knock him like that. And uh, anyhow, I gave them away. And the, at, at the last of the class, I asked them, I told you several things. I did not teach only physics. I told you this thing, I told you this thing, I told you this thing. And then even you are asleep. So what would you do in other periods? Then the monitor told me, sir, in this class, only six of them slept. In other classes, six of them will be awake. <laughs> that is what he told me. What happens? Yes, of course. Why not come and look, have a look? No, no, I won't come to other classes. So that's what happened. So this uh, keeping awake has been a great problem. And it is still yes. a problem. Yeah. So definitely we'll have to provide more techniques to get over that. So we had a related question to that in the comments, so I'd like to share that. So even in an interesting class, students might phase out at a certain point. So do you think like using pop culture references or making content more relatable might help catch their attention more in some regards? Yeah, yeah, uh, I do that. Uh, I often do that. Um, when I see somebody, uh, somebody uh, dozing in classroom or trying to doze, I would uh, consider some example that is directly related to him or her. Mm -hmm. And uh, suddenly wake him or her quickly. So that is what the uh, technique I have been trying. So at least uh, for um, uh, 15 minutes more, he or she will not fall asleep. If I talk mm -hmm. of general things, uh, that person might not be uh, interested. But what I do yeah. is uh, I, 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 I play in my mind. Let me talk about this thing. This, uh, he's, he or she is interested in that. If somebody is interested in fashions, so I might take example from Theo. Yeah. And I related that thing to her or him. If somebody related, somebody is uh, uh, focused on music, or if I sense that he is onto music, I would take some example from music and relate that to that person. So that uh, has kept him or her awake a lot, not many times. So that's why that thing thing works. That thing has worked actually. Yes, sir. So again, being a physics teacher, so in terms of relating things. So are there times when you go about your normal day-to-day -day tasks or chores and you tend to relate what you see with physics principles? And if so, is there any particular instance that stands out? Yeah, definitely, yes. Uh, as a physics teacher, I'm also a very good observer of facts, actually. I observe things very well, I suppose, I suppose, yeah, compared to my colleagues. I think I am more aware of things happening around me when I walk by some streets. Uh, I would feel that uh, if a house is being constructed, I, I would sense uh, yesterday it was uh, he or she has 
has done up to here and now he has done up to here. So if I ask somebody, my family members or my colleagues, they would say, is this so? They would say, they would uh, feel the change only after two or three weeks. Whereas I would like, I would like to uh, sense the change, sense the change every day. So that's the physics has made me a very, very keen observer. So what I did was, uh, once uh, I said in classroom, uh, so we, uh, in my figure, uh, one of my uh, institutions that I work in, so there was uh, our national flag there. So a huge national flag was set up. And of course, when we say flag, it means fluttering of the flags. Uh, so if the flag is just uh, drooping, uh, it's of no use. When it flutters, uh, that uh, uh, brings clear idea about its shape and, and uh, the decorations it has. So the various uh, fact of uh, fluttering of flag is uh, pure physics. The very design of the flag has been pure physics. Because uh, yeah. when uh, there's wind, so when there, there is wind, flag flutters. And when uh, wind is there, what happens is uh, the velocity of air, of course, is uh, high at the top and less at the bottom. Velocity of air, speed of air is in every locality, it is high at the top and uh, less at the bottom. And uh, because of that, the pressure will be reverse. Pressure will be less at the top and high at the bottom because of which there's an upward force. So that's why the clothes which were drooping there, they will rise up. So they will rise up and air will be taking there and they flutter. So that's why uh, I have taken this example. I have given this example very much in classrooms. Similarly, uh, when we walk also, if you walk with a small, small steps, we don't uh, sleep in mud. But if you walk with large, large steps, we sleep. So it's a sheer case of friction. Regarding the angle of friction, the angle that uh, optimum angle for friction. So that's why, uh, so even if I don't want, or even if students don't want, these daily things come into our studies because physics, because of physics, lots of things are there. And uh, without physics, definitely we would not have been able to explain those things. We can say will of the God. It's not a will of the God. A building collapses because of poor design. A building collapses because of poor design. Poor uh, soil structure, maybe. It's not because uh, God was angry. Earthquake is a natural phenomenon. And if you want to make our building safe, we have to have proper design. And plus, the base on which the building stands should also be better one. And definitely, mm -hmm. if we do so, definitely we can be safe from earthquake. So that's why physics is everywhere. So, so it cannot escape us. When I teach a certain concept, our daily life or the events outside cannot escape escape uh, the things that I teach. So uh, often people say, "You have examples for everything, sir." Of course, yes. <laughs> Of course, yeah. because uh, it's because of physics that it is there. Is that it's the, the only thing that we have, to, we have to recognize that. We have to recognize the physics in that and uh, tell other people and make, uh, mm -hmm. make other people also aware of that. Not keep it within ourselves. We have to make it aware to other people as well. So Indeed. that's what I do. Yes, sir. So that truly is the beauty of physics and science in general, right? Of course, yes. Of course, yes. So, Again, I'd like to request our viewers, if you have any questions, do drop those in the comments. Uh, so we have a few questions, which I'd like to go over as well. So we have a question, whether learning preparation, whether learning is preparation for life, or is it life itself? I think it's more than life, maybe. More than life. It's because, uh, as we said, lifelong learning. So lifelong learning means that we are learning mm -hmm. even before maybe our life has begun. Because before life, we were even atoms and molecules. We belong to some other body. And there also right. we should have learned something. So let's say, and after death also, we are atoms and molecules. So those atoms and molecules will uh, go somewhere, be a part of something else. And then also it's learning. So that's why it is not about uh, uh, lifelong or till life. I think learning is beyond life. So life is set within a certain frame, certain frame, but the learning is happening everywhere, every time. So it is that uh, only uh, the difference is that whether we can perceive that learning or not, whether we have that sense or not. So right nowadays we have a human mind, so we can perceive learning, we can define learning, but when uh, we are we become a part of amoeba or we, we become a part of bacteria, at that time we might sense in a different way which is different from the sense that we have now. For example, a dog also has senses, but we can understand his or her language. 
Why? Because the sense we have and the sense the dog have, they are different. But the atoms and molecules are same. So definitely there should be some connection, which yes. we have not been able to, uh, able to, uh, there should be a connection, but which, where we have not been able to find that, that particular link. So mm -hmm. when we can find that link, definitely we can sense things from dogs as well, maybe from, from even uh, germs as well. So definitely I think that, that is going to happen in the, in the future. So that's why learning is beyond life, I should say. Indeed. Thank you for sharing that, sir. So another question that we have is, do you think traditional Nepali or Nevari methods of knowledge, be it medical or engineering, is relevant in the present context and whether there is still more to learn in regards to those as well? Uh, one thing that I would like to share with all people is uh, we, we are the product of history. We yeah. are the product of history. If history is not there, present would not be there. And without present, future would not be there. Actually, what uh, people might not uh, be aware of is that the medical or the engineering or other fields, uh, they are not European products. Actually, they are not European. It, it is the Renaissance that happened there. Medical science was studied in Kathmandu Valley as well, in Banaras as well, in India, in China as well, of course. So that's why the very treasure of knowledge, medical knowledge, or maybe engineering knowledge was very high in South Asia or Asia as a whole. So that's why our system was not outdated. What happened yes. was, what happened was, uh, about uh, for 500 years, Education took a backlog in in uh, in South Asia, let us say, because of war, because of uh, political instabilities or like that. So in those days, uh, Europe exceeded us. Mm -hmm. So uh, let me let me uh, let me quote an incident. Uh, the very subject algebra, algebra mm -hmm. originated in Arab countries. It is al Zabar. So mm -hmm. from al Zabar, it became algebra. Many many theorems of algebra, geometry, they have been proven by Islamic scientists. And what the Europeans did was they copied from those things and uh, they published in their own names. Mm -hmm. And those people just died, their literature just died, but the literature they copied and they just uh, uh, did it in their own names. Uh, and uh, when we say that, we also have to be aware of the fact that uh, there are some people in Nepal and India, uh, whatever invention happened, they say it is in written in the bed. It is written in the bed. It is there in the bed. And I tell them, show me. They can't do so. We, we we should not say that. We should be we should be uh, when we <clears throat> when we uh, try to try to prove our supremacy. Uh, we should also not uh, degrade uh, what uh, Europeans have done. So definitely they have done very good job by introducing modern fields of uh, sciences. But what we should also realize is that most of those fields in most of those fields we were also experts experts at some point of time. For example, let me quote uh, uh, one thing there. <clears throat> uh, uh, since I was born in Kathmandu Valley and uh, I have studied a lot of literatures regarding, uh, regarding the history of the valley, uh, let me quote that uh, many, many foreigners used to come to Kathmandu Valley to, to study. About 1,000 years back, during Lichabikal, Lichabi period, many, many people came, came to Kathmandu Valley to study. For example, one of them was... Uh, uh, the Golden Temple, people say, Golden Temple in Lalitpur. So there's like a university. And one of them is, uh, uh, one of them is, they call as Bhagwan Bahal. It is in Tamil. Tamil. And, uh, uh, and in that, uh, in that courtyard also, uh, people used to learn Sanskrit. People from India, people from Tibet used to come to learn Sanskrit there, in Tamil, in certain courtyard there. So that means uh, Nepal or Kathmandu Valley was a center of knowledge. Arts, craft, we know. But even to learn Sanskrit, people used to come here. Let's leave art and craft. Art and craft, we are experts. We were experts. We, we have exported many, many people out to teach art and craft regarding Arnico. One of them is Arnico. And one of them is, uh, uh, people might not be aware, uh, we did not claim it, but uh, there is one literature in Kolkata, Kolkata, a very old literature in Kolkata. It was found by some uh, people about 100 years back. The The, the the, the statues of uh, Indonesia, Borobudur, they say, they call the location as Borobudur. 
uh, there is a, a hill ma made of rock, and uh, it was rediscovered by the by the English people out of volcanic ashes. And what they found was it was a, like a hill, a, a, like Swembu Swembu hill, and the whole hill was filled with lots of statues of gods and gods and gods and gods, lots of them, thousands of statues. And what uh, that literature in Kolkata said was that thing was made by somebody from Nepal, somebody from Kathmandu, Lalitpur. We didn't know that. Our literature did not say that, but the literature from Kolkata said that a person from uh, Lalitpur, certain 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 joke, he was. Uh, uh, invited by the king of Indonesia, it was called a Subarnabhumi, and he came with a team of uh, team from uh, Nepal itself and uh, uh, Bengal itself. In those days, it was uh, Wanga Desh they call as, and they went to Indonesia to make that structure. So that means, uh, in terms of knowledge, we never lagged behind. We did not lag behind, except these uh, four or five hundred years. So that's why we cannot say our knowledge as a traditional. It was way beyond time. The only thing is that we have to recognize that knowledge and excel in that knowledge. Excel in knowledge. So I saw one uh, one post there. Uh, it showed in one photo. It showed uh, they were uh, pavement of a certain temple. Let us say, it showed that uh, they were made thousand years ago and still there. And the other photo they showed a beach road which had got the potholes there, and then came the engineers. They say. So that means. Uh, Traditionally made things have been equally strong, equally strong than modern things. So for for, for, for proof, you can go to Sangunaran Temple. There are bricks. Uh, there are still there are bricks, uh, which have been laid by King Ma King Mandev. So King the bricks laid by King Mandev are still there. So it has been around 1500 years back. It is still there. So that material of those days, the the the, the technology of those days were far superior, long lasting. But see, nowadays, what will happen to those bricks? So that's why uh, we have to know the value of traditional, so-called traditional education also. And uh, uh, we have to reshape it into our modern times. Let's just not follow the European system saying that they are modern, they are modern. We have to incorporate our knowledge also into our, our modern, modern uh, fields of knowledge. So only with that synthesis that we can make better structures or we can go for better knowledge. We should not blindly follow them. As I said, media bashing. Yes. And what media would say is, they would say their, their things better. They, they, everybody, everybody says that. And we have to know the value of our things also. Not just follow them. We have to know the value of our things as well. So mm -hmm. that, would, uh, be, that would make everything better. Definitely. That's really amazing to hear, sir. And indeed, we should not or we can't disregard our cultural knowledge and rather we should try to incorporate it at the present as well. Of course. So we have another question regarding the education system. Uh, so do you feel that the current way we are educating children fully prepares them for the need of the 21st century? Uh, again, it is... Uh, uh, I would say media bashing again, because uh, uh, <clears throat> the need of a country, for example, what Nepal needs, uh, cannot be cannot be decided by some expert from Europe. What Nepal needs should be should be said by Nepalese Nepalese themselves, and that too without the influence of foreigners. Nowadays, what happens is uh, people from other country universities come here. They take some people into confidence, confidence, and maybe say, uh, let us say they have to sell a vehicle, say a, sell a new vehicle, and uh, they would come to uh, Nepal, uh, visit some people here, and uh, they have some negotiations with themselves, and those Nepalese people would be at policy level. Now they will make some policies, which make that thing essential to the country. <laughs> so that's why, uh, what I mean, that is not the need of Nepal. That's the need of those people and those people, those people and those people. So that's the need of the country. So what we must we must do is first we have to know what is the necessity of Nepal. Nepal does not need knowledge to travel into space. For the time being, Nepal does not need knowledge to travel to space. That is not our priority. Our priority is healthcare. So that means we have to invest more on healthcare. We have to produce more doctors and doctors, nurses, 
medical people. Medical means it's not the doctors and nurses. It's about how to produce medical equipments in our own country. Let, let us say, let us produce spectacles in, in our own country. Uh, during uh, our college days, we heard that this Tilganga Eye Hospital, at the location of Tilganga Hospital, we heard that a spectacle, a spectacle company was being established there. We heard that, but it was turned into hospital. So instead of a producing company, we are uh, we are having a, a, a an hospital which uh, imports things, because there was already a hospital there. The eye hospital was already there, government. So why did we need that Tilganga hospital uh, in that place? So we we heard and we are fully optimistic that the company being established there was spectacle company. Even one of my friends who's, who went to Australia was trying to switch his major to optometry from, a, from some medical field. He was studying radiography, actually. So he wanted to, uh, he wanted to switch into optometry, feeling that he would get employment in the Tilganga, Tilganga company. But later on, they changed the theme and uh, they opened up hospital, a parallel hospital. Though we had a national level uh, eye hospital in Tripurisho, so that's why when we make policies or when we educate people, uh, we first have to prioritize what is necessary for the country and make investment in education in that field. So space science, no, not for us. What is the use of knowing about black holes when we can't even deal with COVID, COVID a simple virus? There have been so many virus infections, uh, SARS virus, MERS virus. Uh, people have not uh, done enough for Ebola virus. And a new virus is there, and they are, they are studying the black holes. What's the use? So definitely not the use. They are having research in the CERN lab. CERN lab they are having research in positrons and something else. So first, let us deal with what is uh, eating up our mind. So our education should be leading to that. That's why uh, in Nepal also, our policies should be, should be devising such education which solve our problems. It is not that... Uh, uh, it is not that... Uh, we should not give get such manpower who go to US or some countries and never return back. They are solving their problem, not our problem. So we should produce such manpower, we solve our problem. So our education, yes. education should be in that line. Yes. So do you uh, regarding this as well, do you feel that our education system is more geared towards just grades like students who study just for the sake of studying without a genuine interest because that's what is somewhat ingrained in the education system actually uh, students uh, don't study for study they study for career what they do is they study for career and uh, their career is shaped by shaped by uh, the career of nepalese people is shaped by maybe harvard maybe cambridge maybe maybe MIT or maybe Princeton. So they will show up a video of a certain scientist and the people here would like to become their scientist. But if uh, uh, we say, uh, they see, Nepalese people see interview about Dr. Sandhuk Ruit, they would not want to be Sandhuk Ruit. They might want to be Sandhuk Ruit, but of Australia, maybe. <laughs> they might want to be Sandhuk Ruit, but of, uh, of uh, maybe UK, not of Nepal. So the first thing that uh, uh, that uh, what uh, government or society or media should uh, try is uh, let us uh, make our people feel a love for the country. Because uh, uh, what we do is if we go overseas, yes, we, we should go there for studies. But uh, uh, if your study is not of any advantage to your country, what's the use? Your people, your relatives, you make a road. You are engineer, you make a road. And if you make a road of USA, what benefit is it for your, your relatives, your, your father, mother, your, your, your family here? So it is only benefiting those people. So at least we should try. We should try at least if I do something, uh, it must benefit my people as well. So if that sense is there, definitely uh, that would work better for every country. So such a sense was very much uh, highly implanted by uh, the premiers of Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew, you would say, we would say, and um, uh, Mahathir Mohamad, uh, the Prime Minister of Malaysia, the first thing they did was they developed a sense of love for the country. They say, whatever you do, at least do something for your country. But in Nepal, it's not there. That sense is not there. Instead, the, the government or, or people 
would give facility to those people who want to go to urban countries to work, who want to go to Malaysia, subsidies, they say, remittance, they say, just they are focusing on the active. Whereas, now what happened during this COVID, all of those people were ejected from the country. Mm-hmm. Though they had virus or not, they simply ejected those people. So that's why ultimately there is no other option than improving our own own place, our own country. So that's education should also be geared towards that. Yes, so that is indeed. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, sir. So last but not the least, as we near the one hour mark. So will we ever see Sajid, sir, in a different field apart from teaching? <laughs> uh, actually, uh, what I decided was I would not do so. But if need be, for example, if need be, uh, I'd like to, um, there are three fields that, that is worth considering. Uh, my traditional, traditionally, we were gurus. So that's why that, uh, uh, that uh, gurus are pujaris, actually, pujaris. So that is one option, of course. So I still have the right to become a pujari, maybe. Maybe I have to ask the other pujaris also uh, whether I'm qualified for that or not. I'll, I'll work hard and do. Uh, next is, uh, 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 the next is business, of course. Uh, two, three generations of uh, my, my forefathers did business also. Actually, they were on to gold business, gold business. So what, uh, I would not be into gold business, but uh, what I say, uh, I would do is uh, I would open up an eatery, eatery. Uh, let us say, let us say in Nepali we call Bojnale, but uh, I would say eatery. And uh, uh, and uh, the way uh, the way I eat food in uh, uh, in other places, I have found them that uh, again it's the same thing there. Feeding people is just their career. Mm-hmm. They feed by not by heart. They feed by hand, but not by heart. So that's why uh, feeding people is a great, uh, uh, great way to uh, earn, uh, earn a good, uh, good merit in our religion. Also, it is said that feeding people is, is something of uh, earning, uh, earning something uh, of good merit. So that's why uh, one business or one career that uh, one career choice that I can go is uh, having a very good uh, eatery at several places in our country, in our country, especially starting from Kathmandu, Bhaktapur, Alalipur. And it might spread to others. And it will be uh, especially Nepalese food items. Just Nepalese food items. I will not go for pizza. I will not go. Because definitely, again, the same thing, media bashing. They have uh, projected as if pizza is the best food. But definitely, it uh, does not compare with our momos. Definitely not. It does not compare with our lot of other things. A lot, lot of other feast, feast items. So definitely, so that is one career choice I, could, I can go. And one other is uh, I could become a transport entrepreneur because my family tried once, uh, tried that once and failed and failed. So I would like to revive that, revive that. Uh, and uh, maybe I can become a, trans- a transport entrepreneur, uh, which will give uh, the best service, best service, better than anything else we have. Because uh, uh, right now what is happening is when I ask some transport entrepreneurs uh, of uh, my locality, during this lockdown, they were they were very free. So I, I asked them, how is the matter? So they said the first thing they had was not about livelihood. They were asking about uh, the, the bank installments, bank installments they were talking about. So what they do is uh, they charge us heavy. They charge us heavy. Uh, they, 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 uh, they do uh, sort of illegal uh, transportations and so on. It's because they are mainly worried about the bank loans. So whatever. So because of their bank loans, people are suffering. So that's why, uh, in my case, uh, wh- what I feel is I should not uh, have the burden of bank bank loans on the people. So I will uh, start from a very uh, low level, low level, from the very basic, and would like to set up a good transport transport company. So that is that is the field that I, I have sometimes in my mind. Uh, though I feel that uh, I cannot remain without teaching. I still feel at heart that even if I'm a very weak or very something like that uh, in future, I cannot remain without teaching because I have always been a teacher at heart. At heart. I used to teach seniors. I used to teach seniors. I used to teach juniors. I used to argue with teachers. I used to give second ideas about uh, what the teacher taught. So that's why that teacher feeling was always in me. So uh, I think, uh, God willing, uh, I will not go away from teaching. If I go, those are the three fields. 
Thank you so much for sharing that, sir. And with that, we are nearing the end of today's TEDcast. And we'd like to thank all the viewers for joining with us today. And we greatly appreciate your presence. And we certainly hope that you got to learn a lot from Sajit, sir. We'd also like to express our gratitude towards Mr. Sajit Chandra Sakya for giving us your valuable time and sharing your invaluable experience with us. It's really great to see your love for teaching and it definitely is contagious. I myself would have wanted to take your class and maybe sometime in the future that might be possible as well. So, sir, if there's any concluding remarks or thoughts that you'd like to pass on to our viewers, the floor is yours. Uh, yeah, so uh, last uh, but not the least, I would say is whatever field you are in, whatever field you are in, teach at least one or two, one or two classes, maybe per semester, per year, maybe. Be with juniors. At least uh, refresh yourself uh, uh, by being with juniors. Go to some school, talk with them. Go to some offices, talk with them. In this regard, I uh, respect Mr. Anil Kesri Sah very much because uh, uh, other people would be partying every evening, maybe because uh, they are very high standard people. But Anil Shah, uh, when we call him to some colleges, he happily comes and he shares lots of ideas with people. So he's a, a very well educated person from a very good family and he shares lots of ideas and he motivates people, a lot of people. Even I talk about him a lot in classes also. So that's why what I, I, I want to say to people is whatever career you are in, do teach. If you're an engineer, do teach. If you're a medical science person, doctor, engineer, whatever you do, do teach. Because uh, your knowledge, your knowledge could be some sort of a, a gem for other people. It will be some sort of magic potion for them. Amrit we call as magic potion for them. And there's one thing I'd like to say at the last. Uh, I happened to encounter a, a let us say, a Ayurvedic uh, doctor, let us say, Vaidya, we call it in our language, Ayurvedic doctor. And he had lots of knowledge. And uh, I went there because I had a problem of allergy uh, when I was teenage. So even a small amount of dust and uh, uh, I would just keep up sneezing. So my mother took him to uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, person. And uh, he told me, uh, I have a uh, certain medicine with me that, that, that will be catering to your problem. But uh, you have to leave all the, uh, leave all the uh, fatty foods at least for three months, 100 days, he said. So can you have this, uh, can you have this medicine, he said. So he prepared something and uh, I, I just took on me. It was very bitter, but uh, I said, I will have, I will have, I, I can do that. So I had that uh, medication for, for uh, 100 days exact. And uh, within those 100 days, what it is was my allergy was gone. It was gone. So that is the magic potion for me. And uh, we became very good friends. Let us say not friends. He was a friend of, he became good friend of my parents. I frequently used to visit his shop. And I said to him, uh, sir, did you, have you taught your children about this thing? I told him. And he said, my children are not willing to learn. So he said his children were not willing to learn his science. And have you taught anybody else? I said, if he said yes, sir, I would have stood up as a volunteer to learn that. And he said, uh, in our field, in his field, it is something, uh, something of uh, super or something like that. Uh, before I teach that, before I teach that, uh, they have to fulfill certain criteria. Certain criteria. It's something religious belief that is. And I have found now I have found no one of that criteria he was saying. So I have not taught that to anything else, anything, uh, any any people. So then, with his date, the knowledge was gone. So what uh, the medicines that he used to have was once he said, uh, if I have I have got a, a meat of jackals, jackals, shall we call as, if I can have a meat of jackals, I can change that into sukuti. He said sukuti. And with that sukuti, I can make medicine for asthma. He was saying. That was his knowledge. Mm -hmm. I will make medicine for asthma. My, uh, I have made this a few years back. Now it is finished. If uh, somebody brings me uh, some jackal or meat of jackal, I will make that medicine. So the knowledge was with him. But with his death, it's gone. So that's why had he taught uh, whether they, people qualify or not, 
maybe that is his superstition only maybe that is uh, that is his wrong belief maybe but had he taught uh, that thing to others uh, that person could have carried that knowledge forward so that's why knowledge is uh, definitely something to be shared and knowledge is not to be kept in ourselves because after our death after we are gone it's gone so if you want if you have a love for that knowledge definitely we should be passing that thing to others so whatever field we are in we should teach so that's the only thing i i i would say this at this moment thank you so thank much you. sir once again we are truly humbled to have you here with us and what an amazing way to kick off tedcast with that we have come to the end of the first ever iteration of tedcast hosted by tedx maitigar we'd like to share also share to you about ted circles which is a closed circle discussions on various ted talks on themes given by ted itself we'll be hosting ted circles regularly and do check out the link in the comments for more information last but not the least thank you all for joining us today and we truly hope that you enjoyed the discussion as much as we did namaste and goodbye everyone it's your host for today signing off from the first ever iteration of tedcast hosted by tedx mythigar thank you very much thank you